how are you sorry <laughs> um that i came like a minute late um could you do me a favor and um, make me a moderator so how you do that is you click on my profile picture and um, on the bottom there should be an option make moderator so that way i can share um, put the presentation up and perfect thank you how are you today can you hear me can you hear me now yes now i can hear you yeah excellent i think i think mark is having some kind of difficulties uh logging we are solving this out otherwise i probably will set up a team meeting so we can use team as a as a bridge and his voice can be <laughs> transferred to to this clubhouse somehow it's yeah that's that's a plan we are waiting uh we i'm waiting for him for his reply on the email at the moment yeah you save you received the powerpoint right yes mm -hmm, i did great thank you um yeah so regular issues are he he needs to log in the first time with the phone and not the desktop that sometimes is an issue yeah, I, th I think he is trying to log on uh through his phone but okay. his number his phone number is not recognizable somehow it is a standard uk number i'm not sure how oh, um, not, yeah not that's weird. He de he didn't get the confirmation uh, message on his phone. Uh, usually, you get like a confirmation message. Um, probably not yet. He's uh, he's just, I c I think he's doing something at the moment. And then, what sometimes also is a problem if you're at a university or so. Sometimes the the Wi-Fi, uh, the settings block a social media interaction. So using then cellular data instead of the the institute Wi-Fi usually also helps. Ah, I see. I'll I'll let him know this. I, I think at this point he's at home now. It's seven o'clock UK time. Yeah, then it should be fine. Um. What else could the pro? Yeah, the, the, it's weird that with the phone number, usually I never heard that. Yeah, he's, uh, he, he said the code, uh, he is trying to connect the code is zero ones. Right. Um, He says uh, his phone number is not supported. I'll I'll, use, I'll set up a team meeting on our side so he can talk. This this is just yeah. This, this I'm not sure how it's. Yeah, I don't. I never heard that. That is so weird. Mm. Not worth that. That is. So, did he try to? Does he put zero zero in or plus and then the UK? I think he tried everything. It's. Uh, uh. Because when you click this, it it auto pack, uh, it asks you to choose a country, so it's always plus. Right. Yeah, it's always plus. Yeah. So. Huh. Mm, yeah. I don't know. I've never heard of that problem. We had different problems, but that's the first. <laughs> it's a, a new problem. <laughs> it's a new problem. Well, we still have minutes and even if we take yeah. a little bit longer to start it's not an issue so yes anyways it's, it's friday so <laughs> yeah happy friday <laughs> yes yeah, so i hope so your week good. was good yeah good good week yes and oh. um hi everyone uh we will start in a little bit um our guest like ray is here but um then also mark wanted to join um to give the talk he's having issues i don't know if any one of you had heard of this issue before that his uk phone number 
says they don't it's not supported that phone number i don't know if anyone in the room experienced that ever before and what the solution is for it uh, i don't have any but um if the it's but ray is setting up a meeting like um uh, Google Meet or so um, on his side. So the voice of Mark will be also streamed through Ray's account. So that's, I think that's a solution. Um, yes, I'm, I'm trying to use, uh, I'll talk to Mark while Teams and then we can, <laughs> we can pretend he's on the uh, clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for doing that. I'm so glad that that's yeah. right there. This technology is, is just a, <laughs> yeah it's kind of good and bad it's like both on the one side you know if we would if we would traditionally meet we would never have you know get to know so many people because it would be harder but then on the other hand there's still a lot of issues so <laughs> yeah Scene shouting, Oi, mate, you're only supposed to move diagonally at Justin Welby. Hello, hi, Mark. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I can't, I can't get this bloody clubhouse thing no. to accept my phone numbers. It's, it's, it's sometimes difficult. I got some issues as well, but I think your voice at the moment can be transferred to the clubhouse uh, app. Um, Katerina, can you hear Mark? Yes, I can hear. Can can Mark? Can you hear me? Um, maybe I don't know if Mark can hear me. If the streaming works well enough. If not, you have to translate, right? Something I thought of um, quickly Mark, is that. Hear... Sorry, I I just thought maybe try the plus four four, um, to put that in before the number, and that might work. Uh, Ray, can you still hear us? Sorry, uh, I didn't oh. hear uh, the other gentleman's. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We we also discussed that Kyle to put the plus four four first and then the number. That would make a difference, but I think Mark tried tried that as far as I can. As right, far as Mark, I can. Uh, Mark, did you did you try? I mean, use. Not a zero zero four four, but a plus four four. Yeah, I've got in now. It's, it's asking me what five topics do I enjoy talking about. Oh, you are, yeah, you are, then you're you are on now. Oh, great. Just skip that so part. How, how do I get? Then to, uh... you you go to the you go to her email. You go to the email I send you, and there's a link. Use your phone. Use your phone and right. click. Hang on, hang on, hang on. As, yeah, it took me ages to figure this out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, no, no worries. It's a, it's a new technology. <laughs> uh, uh, well, thank you for going through that. We really appreciate it. So, yeah. Um, in the meantime, everyone, um, thank you for coming. Share the room if you think this is interesting for some people. Uh, you know, and we will start soon. Oh, I see Mike. Okay. In the meantime, I have to. Right. Share. You you click the link. Does it say that? I mean, open in the in the app Clubhouse app or something like that. Yeah. So now, now the presentation also works. Perfect. <laughs> Where did you send it to me? Uh, I can Probably send. I? I can send the you. Send it, it. We'll send it again. Yes, I'll send you yeah. again. And uh, um, I can also send it. Okay. 
Okay. I just sent the link again. I don't know if Mark can hear me, but um, I just sent the link. And um, in the meantime, let me share with everyone the um, paper in the chat. Um, there. There, everyone, and everyone can uh, now check out the presentation and that will be used. Great, thanks. And we will start in a minute. <laughs> um, we'll start by introducing our guest speakers. So if you see Mark. Okay, I've got the link. Let's hang on. It's just now you should yeah. be just clicking on the link. It should bring and then join room in progress. The the app should pop up and then you click on join room in progress. Let me know if that works. So if I hit happening now, should I get through? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And let me see. I'm checking if you're there. Let me know when you're when you see uh, Ray and um, and myself. Taking me back to get the app. Yeah, that's a weird thing. It asks you to get the app, and then you go to Google, and then the Google Play says that you already have the app. You just click open, and then it goes to the app. <laughs> yeah. Um... I couldn't add Mark to the speaker list because, you know, he didn't have the, he wasn't following me, so. No, no, it's take me back to loading the app again. So are you in Mark, the app right uh, now? Let uh, me. Mark, can you hear, hear her when she speak talking? Uh, we yeah. can, you can't hear. Okay. Okay. So are you, you right now in I mean, you, um, no, I can't find you because you're not following me. No, she, I'm probably, I'm probably will keep this. I think you can hear Mark and Mark can hear you as well. So, and then we can, we can start. Okay. Already for me. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, let's start. And if it works out in the meantime, that's good. So welcome everyone to the science society. And of course, a uh, special welcome to Ray and Mark. And before we start, let me give you a little bit of an introduction. So you know, um, yeah, you, you get to know the guest speakers a little bit um, better. So Ray um, Liu, he's our early China collection curator at the British Museum. And he specialized in archeological science and museum collections. And he's an Oxford alumni, um, and um, he did his. Um, he went to School of Archaeology, University of Oxford, and did there um, his master's degree, and then he did his uh, PhD also at the School of Archaeology, University in Oxford. Um, and he he is a thesis was about um, studying scientific um, scientific studies on ancient Chinese bronzes, including technology and the um, provenance of metal and wider social impact. And um, yeah, and um, then we have Professor Mark Pollard. You will hear his um, voice um, being streamed through a race um, account. He's an Edward um, Hall Professor of Archaeological Science um, he, and the Director of the Research Laboratory for Archaeology and the History of Art. And um, 
His research over the past 35 years has encompassed the application of the physical sciences, uh, particularly um, chemistry in archaeology, and he and has included a wide range of topics. Um, his research can be summarized under the main three um, focus points, the study of archaeological materials, the investigation of biogeochemical processes, and numerical application in archaeology and paleoclimatic reconstruction. And um, yeah, he has um, been supported by different, by many research grants, and he um, he published um, a lot of work around that. So um, welcome, um, and thank you so much for taking the time to come here today. We really appreciate it. And usually before we start, we ask like a couple of interview questions, if that's okay with the both of you. And the question we have for you is, what um, did you always want to become a researcher and archaeologist? Was that like a childhood dream or was something that sparked your interest in the field? Um, maybe a book or, um, or a great teacher, a great class. And um, yeah, if, if you both would like to answer, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Mark, can you, do you want to answer this question first? I guess <laughs> you've got a lot to say. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, well, can they hear me? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I started out as a theoretical physicist um, and sort of came into archaeology as a, um, an un, a, a postgraduate student, and I've been working in it ever since. So the answer is no, I didn't really intend to be an archaeologist. Um, I've just retired as the professor of archaeological science at the University of Oxford. So um, I've been doing it 45 years. And um, what got me into it actually was the 1972 exhibition at the British Museum on the finds from Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, which was pretty spectacular. Uh, for, oh, for me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for me, I guess um, the most important thing is that actually I'm one of Mark's PhD students, and I really appreciate my supervisor's help to, to, to put me on this wonderful field. My, my background was kind of, uh, was, science, uh, was mainly science, and I was trained as a conservation scientist from Northwest University in China. And then I came to Oxford to, and, and, and met Mark and other, other uh, colleagues, and I started archaeological science. And then I find, find this field is really, really fascinating, especially the, the, the subfield, which we often call archaeometallurgy. It's basically to look at the metal and the metallurgical remains uh, in, in, in the archaeological field. And I just spent, I just like spending time with metals, especially bronzes. The, the, the I mean, now I'm a, a, a early China uh, collection curator at British Museum, so um, we got uh, quite a lot of beautiful Chinese bronzes, and um, I, s I sometimes can spend it like a like a whole day just look looking at them, the patina, the decoration, and the technology, etc., etc. So it's uh, it's kind of like really the fascination fascination with bronzes that uh, that take me to this field. Wow, that's a uh... Both stories are, are really uh, wonderful and interesting um, that Mark switched later on his career. Um, and then, Ray, that you um, basically um, work in the field that you're really passionate about. And um, um, it, it, on, on Mark, on the website, you really look like a real life Indiana Jones. I'm sorry with the hat. And um, that's why I thought you always probably were wanted to become an archaeologist so it's so interesting to hear um, that uh, you you later on uh, switched so that's really interesting and um 
for for this um project is there maybe a background story around this project was there maybe a surprising find that kind of um you know tr triggered uh you investigate this more or was it maybe um yeah is there like a behind the curtain story ab about this project thank you right uh mark maybe i answer this first so much, sorry yeah yeah, yeah. The, there's ray and i have been looking at the chemical composition of chinese bronzes for 10 years 12 years something like that and it, it's clear when you look at the literature that um, there are some problems in the um, in the interpretation of the chemistry of bronzes that have been around for a long time. And one of them is a text called the Kaogongji, uh, which I don't know if you've got the PowerPoint, but it's on the first slide of the PowerPoint. And the Kaogongji was written in, well, it was sometime during the Warring States, which is 300-ish BC, something like that. But it's probably an older document. And the literature on, the modern literature on Chinese bronzes has been around for 100 years, um, trying to interpret what the Kaogongji actually says and so that's a problem ray and i have thought about off and on for 10 years and it was actually while we were working on the chemical composition of um, early chinese coinage uh, pre-chin coinage so before 221 bc um, but I began to notice that there were very strong correlation lines in the chemistry of these coins when you plot the data. And that got me thinking about how the coinage was made, actually how the metal was made as it was being poured into the moulds. And, um, and that started us thinking again about Kaogongji. So it's a it's something that's been around for a long time and i think we've got a different answer to the one that the majority of particularly chinese scholars have come up with and if we're correct then it introduces an interesting level of complexity in how we interpret the the data from the chemical analysis of of chinese bronzes right Great. And um, just to follow on Marx, actually, there are a lot of, lot of stories uh, to talk about. I mean, actually, the, the paper uh, Katerina just kindly shared is really led by Marx. It's, uh, it's uh, really his pioneer uh, uh, research that caused, I mean, in 2000, 2010, I mean, what, uh, the second year of COVID, last year, actually, we uh, Mark actually, I mean, uh, together, uh, I'm, I'm on that paper as well, we published a paper on the Chinese coinage to look at the how the relationship what is what are the correlations between the uh, three major components in the Chinese bronzes copper tin and the lead and at that time Mark got this brilliant idea that this pre alloy ingots and then he, one day he just came to me say that well how about we correlate the pre alloy ingots with the <laughs> with the jin and xi and at that time I was kind of like Wow, that's a, that's a great idea. But I mean, then we, we try it out. It really took us a, quite a long time to think that that is really really a great uh, great idea. It's mainly because over the last uh, ten years or so, I mean, Mark and uh, the other professor, Professor uh, Jessica Rosen from Oxford, often took me to China and look at the mining sites, look at the archaeological sites, and once out of these trips, uh, that is really striking is the the massive, uh, the large scale production of bronzes back to the uh, Bronze Age, chi uh, Chinese Bronze Age, which is like 3000 years ago. I mean, in one single tomb, you can sometimes dig out like a ton of metal and uh, to, produce, to, to produce this kind of uh, 
I mean, one ton of metal requires like a, a hundred tons of copper ore, something like that. that. So, so the the production scale is re was really striking at that time. And the question is, how did they manage this 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 uh this large scale production? And then one obvious clue is to look at the text evidence. And this is this Kaogongji is one of the earliest that we uh, that we can find at the moment to describe how the Asian people manage the massive production in China. But there, as 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 you can see from this paper, there are quite a lot of mismatches between what it has been said in the Kaogongji, the six recipes, or and and the the scientific analysis of the of the bronze objects. And this kind of mismatch has been um, bothered, uh, been bothered to the archaeologists for a hundred years. And then we got this idea that uh, pre-alloy elements, pre-alloy ingots mi mixed together, and that can, I mean, does not, as we said in the paper, it's not like the 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 ultimate answer to this question, but it provides a optimal optimal model to explain why the, the six recipes. Are mismatched, mismatched with the with the scientific data of the bronzes. Yeah, wow, finish. Interesting <laughs> that how persistent you uh, you continued this. Um, um, you know, so that's really amazing. And yeah, so everyone, the presentation is pinned on top of the room. Feel free to click on it and follow along while uh, Mark and Ray present it and. Yeah, thank you so much. The the stage is yours, uh, Mike and Ray. Thank you. Ray, shall I just talk people through the few slides? And uh, if that people are able to um, see the slides, we can just explain some of the um, the ideas behind the the uh, project. Does that work? Yes, that's a plan. And uh, I mean, when you flip over the slide probably you want to tell yeah. tell the audience a number of thank you great okay so i'm on the second slide which uh, has kaogongji written at the top and i've quoted from a, a japanese scholar in 1936 who translated the kaogongji into uh, japanese and english and I give you two recipes there. There are six of them, but I just give you two as an example. And the first says the gin is divided into six, tin occupies one. This is the receipt for bells and tripod vessels. And then the second recipe says the gin is divided into five, tin occupies one. This is the receipt for axes and hatchets. So there are six of those for different sorts of uh, vessels, objects. And the question is, um, well, there are two ways of interpreting those statements. One is to think that gin is a generic term and refers to the total amount of metal, in which case the first, re the first line could be interpreted as um, the formula translates as the final alloy being divided into six parts, five of which are copper and one is tin. And that gives you a, a recipe of 83.3% copper and 16%, 16.7% tin. But the second way of interpreting it is to say that gin is just copper and therefore the first recipe is um, six parts copper to one part tin, which gives you 85.7 and 14.3. Um, I don't think that difference is very important in the overall thing, but the question is how do we interpret gin, the terms gin and sheep from this um, old manuscript? And if you go to the third slide, um, what were gin and she? Um, the, the traditional interpretation, which is what I've just taken from Chikashige, is that gin is copper and she is tin. 
And then you can calculate from the six recipes what the six formula give you. And you can use interpretation one or interpretation two. They're slightly different, but it doesn't matter very much. But the real problem is that we now have hundreds of analysis of Joe Dynasty bronzes. And almost all of them are actually ternary copper uh, alloys of copper, tin, and lead. So the first problem that you get is how do you interpret a, a binary mixture of gin and she? If they're pure elements, then you can't make a ternary alloy from two pure elements. So the conclusion and the first, which I think is the, one of the main obvious conclusions is that either gin or she or both of them must be a composite alloy. They can't just be pure copper and pure tin. So in a sense, that's the starting point of the whole discussion. But if you go to the next slide, which says traditional interpretation, um, I've got the six recipes down here, one to six. The six different typologies, the first one is bells and ding vessels, axes and hatchets. And then the, the two interpretations of the formula, this is assuming that, that um, gin is copper and she is tin. It gives you the uh, data on the right-hand side of the table, two sets of compositions. And it's been known for 70 years at least that these compositions don't correspond to real alloys that we can measure from the Zhou dynasty. So in a sense, that's where that's where the problem has been for, you know, up until about five years ago. Um, but shall I just carry on, Ray? Yes, please. OK, if you go to the next slide, which is a plot of percentage tin against percentage lead, this is the work that we were doing a couple of years ago on um, the chemical composition of early coinage in China. This is for a set of coins called knife coins. I'll show you a picture of them in the next slide. And what's striking about this diagram is there are very strong linear trends in the data. Um, and there's the, the, the strong trend is from high tin, relatively low lead, to low tin, relatively high lead. And you can draw different lines through that data. And that was what got me started thinking about the fact that these are not just simple mixtures of copper tin and lead. They're mixtures of um, specific components. And the simplest way is to think of how do you mix two components to get that correlation um, in the data. So if you go to the next slide, um, on the left hand side, there's a picture of some of these uh, preaching coins. Um, the, the bottom row has two different sets of knife coins, so-called, because they look like knives. Uh, the top row has some spade coins and some, what are called ant nose coins. But on the right-hand side, I've just plotted the data from these coins, and um, I then started modeling the composition, just building little... Um, compositional models say what happens if you add so much of this to so much of that and the red line going down more or less following the trend of the data it doesn't fit all the data nobody's nobody's claiming that this is the recipe but what what i am suggesting is that there's a model there and this particular model is made by taking an alloy of 80% copper, 50% tin, and 5% lead, which is a typical composition of Joe Dynasty ritual bronzes, and adding to it increasing amounts of a second component, 
And that, that second component, the red line, is a binary mixture of lead and copper, 50-50 lead and copper. The green line, which doesn't fit the data so well, is what happens if you take that bronze composition, 80-15-5, and add pure lead to it. And it doesn't fit the data. So I'm excluding a simple model of, of alloying just with lead. And I'm, so what I'm suggesting on the preaching coinage is that if you that you can replicate the composition of many of the coins using an approximate binary composition of mixing 8015.5, which is a typical bronze composition of the Joe Dynasty vessels, and adding to it this 50-50 copper lead mixture. And the reason I think that's plausible is that um, the archaeological record in China has turned up lumps of binary copper lead, uh, which some Chinese scholars have said were primitive coinage. But actually, I think the simplest way of interpreting them is that they're a pre-alloyed component for making these coins. And you simply take some pure bronze and dilute it with this binary mixture. And that's quite a radical suggestion because um, it's saying there's an additional step in the metal production for making, um, in this case, coins. Uh, there's an additional step in the process which says that um, actually at the point of casting the coinage, the, the metal workers are using pre-prepared alloys simply to mix them together and produce coins which have this typical composition. Um, and we published that last year, um, and, and that... Um, I think is interesting. Um, but that then, that in my mind, triggered a memory of trying to interpret the Kaogongji, which starts with two components and you mix them to produce what has to be a ternary composition. And so if you go to the next slide, this is the table we just published in the antiquity paper which gives the approximate composition of the six recipes, starting with an 80% copper, 50% tin, and 5% lead alloy at one end, and a binary 50-50 copper alloy at the other, and just add increasing com uh, amounts of the, the binary alloy to dilute the primary alloy. And... Um, if you then look at the data, the next slide, this is, this is a, in a sense disappointing because the data shown here are the blue dots are the chemical composition of analyzed bronzes from elite tombs during the Zhou dynasty. And the colored dots are the, the six compositions that come from the Kaogongji. And you can see that, I mean, the best you can say is that they sort of fall in the envelope um, of the composition of these Zhou dynasty bronzes, but they don't match all that well. Um, and I'll come to that on the last slide. The The the, the next slide just shows some of the modeling that I did. Um, you can see various mixing lines on a tin against lead diagram. And the three that start at the origin of this diagram, zero, are what happens if you just take pure copper and add to it a tin lead binary alloy which is, in a sense, the simplest way of doing this. But you can see that the correlation structure doesn't fit the data at all. Um, the correlations are positive going up from zero. And if you flip back to the previous slide, you'll see that the correlation data within those Joe Dynasty bronzes are, um, don't follow that pattern. 
but they do follow the diagonal line patterns, which are various sorts of um, mixing copper tin with lead or copper lead with tin. So I think the correlation structure that you see in the data is telling us that these are quite a complicated binary composition from the um, from from the correlation structure within the data, and the last slide is is problematic, um, but I think I understand why it's problematic. The triangles show the um, six compositions. Um, modelled from one of the, the binary mixture that I talked about earlier, and the dots, which are all over the place, are the compositions of those um, forms which are supposed to be made according to this uh, recipe. And clearly, the vast majority of them don't fit at all. So I think if, if I was to summarise what we're trying to say, I think that um, the correlation structure within the data, both of the coinage and also in the Zhou Dynasty vessels, suggests that a, a binary mixture of um, uh, a bronze copper tin lead with a copper lead alloy does replicate the patterning in the data to some extent. Um, but that in detail, we don't replicate the composition of the vessels or the objects that we're supposed to be replicating if we believe the Kaogong gene. So the argument comes down to, and perhaps this is something Ray needs to talk about, what does the Kaogong Ji actually represent? I think we now know what Jin and Shi are. And that's an important point because, as I said earlier, it, it suggests that there's an extra step in the metal production sequence that means somebody somewhere is creating these uh, pre-prepared alloys to go to the casters who are making the coins or the vessels. And that's something we didn't really know about. But it still leaves us with the problem of what does the Kaogong G, the document itself, actually represent? Ray, I'm going to pause there and get you to add to that. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, uh, uh, good, good. We can keep on keep uh, developing on this last slide because cause actually in the last 100 years, years or so, as, as Mark just said, that mm, archaeological scientists try to understand the mismatch between the scientific data of the excavated bronzes and uh, what has been recorded in the Kaogongji, uh, the six recipes. And uh, that, that is quite, I mean, we, in the paper, we cite Pro Professor Falkenhausen and his argument is that the, the Kaogongji, depending on the audience, the author, the, uh, of the context in which it, it was created, it, I mean, the the exact accuracy of the description might be uh, doubtful. That that is probably I mean that uh, that calms down the calms down the debate for a while. But uh, as more and more bronzes are excavated and analyzed, uh, then this question goes uh, raise up again. Say that uh, now we have more data. We look at the Kaogongji uh, again, and still there's some mismatch. So that really boils down to the question that how much accurate or how, how, much, um, how much exact information we can extract or we can believe uh, within the Kaogongji uh, six recipes. And I think Mark, what Mark just said is, uh, I mean, we can believe half, half actually, the Jin and the Xi, Xi does exist, they do exist to some level, like the pre-alloyed ingots, and we can, we can use that to Describe uh, to to understand the ternary alloying perfectly. That's 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 and we can explain it. Uh, we explain the mathematical correlations uh, as Mark just said. The model, the relationships with the uh, with the pre-alloyed ingot argument. But we still, I mean, as the last slide slide show that, I mean, we still find a mismatch between the uh, archaeological some 
archaeological data and the six recipes. That there are several reasons for this because archaeology is always fragmented. Many people, many scholars argue that this is, uh, I mean, Kaogongji was created by the Qi people, the one of the six, one of the seven um, last uh, strong, um, powerful state in the warrior state, warrior state period, and uh, because because they use the Qi Qi writing, Qi um, Qi grammar, etc., etc. And this this slide just show you the the data for from the Qi state. And uh, to be honest, the the, the metallurgy of the Qi state is not is so far not very well understood. So I mean the data is very is very few, and probably in the in the when more data uh, are analyzed and published, and we plot more data uh, on this map, we can on this plot we can we can see that there's a, some kind of better match between the archaeological data and the six recipes. Or another interpretation is that the, I mean the six, some part of the six recipes, especially the exact ratios like uh, one to five, one to six, they are just not not correct. That is. Uh, because I mean, it is kind of like uh, I mean, the assumption is that uh, I mean, the the author was just trying to deliver this to the to the royal house, and nobody really um, really cares about what what happened down down to the workshop level. So I mean, this is uh, this is open to question, but I think we can understand the different levels of the accuracy buried in the uh, uh in the six recipes. That is uh, that is something I want to just. Uh, Quickly reflect. Yeah. Uh, can I build on that for a second? Um, I think we have to think about what the Kaogongji actually is. And if you look at the history of the document itself, um, it first appears in in a bigger volume. It's part of a larger book. The book is called Zhou Li, which is the rights of Zhou. And it was a manual written, let's say, three or four hundred BC um, for the elite court to say, how do you organize an empire? Essentially, it was a manual for running the, the Chinese empire at the time. And the the Kaogongji was probably added to it from an earlier source. And we don't know how early that source is. But my speculation is that it might be much earlier, that it might come from the Western Zhou dynasty, which is around uh, 1000 BC through to 700 BC, roughly. So maybe a few hundred years before the rites of Zhou were written down. And uh, the reason I think that is that if you look at the dynastic history of the Zhou, um, the Zhou succeeded the Shang in 1043 BC. And, um, and in the early part of the Western Zhou, um, the Zhou dynasty followed the Shang dynasty model very carefully. It, had, uh, it used lots of ritual and it was a highly centralized state, very much like the Shang was. But there were a number of issues and revolutions, and the Zhou, the Western Zhou, gradually decentralized to the point where the Zhou dynasty itself was only in titular control of the Chinese um, state. And the, 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 the various different states, the Qin state, the uh, Yan state, all became much more powerful and essentially only paid, if you like, lip service to the Zhou dynasty. So I think what you see is a fragmentation of the power of the central Zhou dynasty. So my suspicion is that the Kaogongji relates to an earlier period when the Zhou dynasty actually did control the metal supply across China and was able to dictate, um, you know, certain rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't apply to the date of the Kaogongji that we've got, which is three or 400 BC, by which time 
China has disintegrated into, well, finally a set of six states, which are called the warring states, and they're fighting each other. And gradually the Qin, uh, the Qin state becomes the dominant um, state when the first emperor, Qin Shuangdi, um, took over in 221 BC. So I think you've got to look at the documentary history of the Kaogongji to, re to suggest that it might relate to an earlier period when the Zhou were much more in control. I mean, the, the, the other side of that, as Ray has said, is that maybe it was simply a fiction provided to the court to try and uh, assure the imperial uh, family that everything was under control, whereas what was really happening was quite different. And maybe the answer is a bit of both of those. Right. Um, yeah, I think uh, we finish our talk. Um, yeah, thank you so much for giving us this insight into your work. Um, it's so interesting how uh, from analyzing what the possible different uh, materials used um, lead to this bigger picture of how, um, how the whole structure of the empire changed over time maybe. So that is really interesting to me, those conclusions or those, um, um, yeah, what all of this entails, basically, and um, so, <clears throat> what what do you think was the um, the upside of using um, these different components of the metals? Was it to make it cheaper, basically, or more moldable, or was the efficiency or availability of certain metals? Like, do you know? anything about that um like how much was available how were they mining it um did, did people find like maybe ancient mines or something like that right uh mark do you do you want to start no, you to answer that, right. uh, i'll start okay yeah uh sure i mean actually in, in terms of the in terms of the advantage of the the using uh using uh pre alloy uh, ingots. I think I think the advantage. I mean, it's there are there are quite a lot. The major one is actually craft specific specification, because I mean it is essentially even in the in, in the modern market we we can buy this kind of uh, pre alloyed ingot that that gives you a a quality control that that I mean because this this object uh, this uh, ingot are already pre alloyed according to a fixed ratio. And you can use it just directly turn into a a a, a object. Um, a fifteen percent tin, five percent lead. That is that is really good quality of metal. And you can turn it turn into a sword, turn into a a bronze ritual vessel with a with a right color. And and also um, it, you don't need to you don't need to uh, do extra amount of work. Basically, you don't need to uh, worry about the purity of your metal. You don't you don't you don't need to weigh the metal accordingly like how much tin how much lead you weigh them together and add them together according to the recipe so it saves a lot of work that really underpins the 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 the, the large scale production I think and uh, another point is that I mean uh, in the in the uh, Western Zhou or towards the end of the Western Zhou Eastern Zhou uh, di uh, dynasty the spring autumn warring states I mean there are loads of local uprisings. I mean, local laws, local families, local royal families. Uh, they they were rising up and they they compete with each other, like not only militarily but also um politically, culturally, aesthetically. And this kind of uh, pre alloying uh, ingots really give them the opportunity to to show off their uh, their bronze objects like um, uh, 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 correct me correct me if i'm wrong mark i mean it's something like a step into the uh, somebody step into a modern market and you show so many so many um different kinds of clothes and uh, and they they tell you that 
not they are not only good in the um, styles, the, but also good at you know the the materials, the the, the technology is also good. So it act as extra extra agency or extra um, value to to the to the product you own or you 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 want to purchase. And in terms of the in terms of the sources of metal, actually, um, most of the copper mines and the most importantly, uh, tin mines are along the Yangtze River Valley. That is modern day southern southern China, and that is the most important uh, source of metals um, throughout Chinese Bronze Age. And uh, and the 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 uh, the, uh, the the emperors of the Western Zhou, I mean even even died while fight, fighting against the southerners to capture their 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 um uh, their metals. So there, you can see there's a lot going on between the between the central plains of China and the southern Yangtze River, just because just because the metal supply. Yeah, that's uh, Mark. Do you want to add anything on it? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one is that I think I think we need to remember that certainly um, in the late Shang, uh, twelve hundred BC through to the Western Zhou before about seven seventy BC that bronze was a strategic metal. It was the strategic metal of the empire. And the reason for that is that bronze was used to make these ritual vessels. And these ritual vessels were the symbol of imperial power, but also the mechanism by which the emperors um, communicated with the ancestors, and ritual was at the heart of the uh, Shang and Zhou dynasty. So these things would have had massive um, symbolic strategic importance. That would begin to break up with the Eastern Zhou, I think, because the rituals changed. And um, so I think we've got to remember that this thing, that, that the supply of copper, tin and lead was absolutely central to the um, to the well-being of the state right through until at least the Eastern Zhou. Um, the, the other thing I'd, I'd say, uh, relating to the actual practice of casting, um, there are one or two references in the Chinese literature. I'm thinking, I guess, of the, um, the, the grand historian Suma Chen and uh, saying that um, the, the people who cast the bronzes, particularly in terms of the coinage, were not very skilled. They weren't the top craftspeople. So one advantage of supplying them with these pre-prepared alloys is that less skilled craftspeople could do that job. So I suspect it's a hierarchical thing. And we could talk about early, other work we've done about the social stratification of access to resources. But I think, I, I think the, one of the key things is that um, it makes it easier for less skilled craftspeople to follow a recipe if they're given these binary alloys these pre-prepared alloys and they don't need you know to to do all of the mixing and the preparation themselves so i think i, I think on those two grounds the the question of the sources of copper tin and lead as ray's mentioned um, we are getting a much better picture now through Chinese archaeological research of where these mines are and we've got dates on some mines and, you know, there's some been excavated. So we know a bit about where this copper and tin and lead is coming from. But what's, what's really at the heart of this question is how do you organize a massive empire? I mean, remember, you know, we're talking on the scale of Western Europe, if not bigger. How does an empire like that, based in uh, Anyang or, or the, the, uh, the, the Zhou capitals, how, how does an empire like that control the metal supply? 
And, I, you know, that's a question that I think we're all still thinking about. How, how did that metal supply system work? Uh, because we're talking about it's 800 kilometers from um, mm. Anyang down to the Yangtze River. Uh, across not very easily traversed. I mean, you can use the river system to some extent. But how was that organized? And, and, and it's a really crucial question because the scale of bronze production during the Shang and the Zhou was absolutely massive. It was clearly an imperial activity, and it was a very large-scale operation. So how do you supply metal over 800,000 kilometers, and how do you ensure that you know, the, the imperial capital has access to the right sorts of materials at the right time? So it's quite a big economic and social question that we're really thinking about. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I, you know, now it's quality control is then still, I think, you know, a big and large effort for many companies, especially if you look into medicine, like a GMP, like, um, you know, to have the, the right, um, right quality, cleanliness and so on. And back, um, and with all the technology we have nowadays, so to streamline that and to have all the, I guess you have to monitor it and have the quality control and then, yeah, the distribution, um, it's it's very impressive. So was it, how, how was it structured? With those manufacturers, it's manufacturers basically and the people, the quality control people, were they like higher up in the social structure or like was the or bureaucracy was it the well seen well paid type of, of system that that enforced that so well uh, i think we can we can begin to answer that question if i just talk for a few minutes seconds about some other work that ray and i have done which is slightly earlier, it's during the Shang dynasty, when Anyang was the capital, so 1200. Um, what we showed there, I think very clearly, is that your social status dictated how you could access metal. So if you look at the very elite, the imperial family, essentially, the, you know, the, the really top elite, they had access to very pure metals, which had very fine levels of quality control on them. They could essentially get the best, I think, is one way of putting it. And as you come down the social scale, you're still dealing with elites because um, it's only the elites that would have had um, access to any quantity of metal. But you can see more diversity in the alloying composition and in the trace element. So the way we interpret that is that the, at the top level, the, the emperor's court must have had um, craftsmen or craftspeople of the very highest quality who could command the best material. So the emperor could command very pure copper if he wanted it. And their metal, their, their ritual bronzes were made only of the finest material. But lower down the social scale, um, we begin to see what we think is some recycling of metal. Um, we begin to see much more diversity of trace element compositions so I think lower down the social scale, you you still had access probably to the imperial foundries, but you didn't get the best stuff. The best stuff was kept for the emperor. And, you know, just as a diversion, that sort of model continues through Chinese history. If you look at ceramic production in the Ming Dynasty, you get exactly the same. You get imperial kilns which are using the very best quality material, and that can only go to the emperor, whereas lower down you can get 
good quality, but not as good as the emperor. So I think the whole question of metal supply, access to these really strategic resources is a, is a, a really socially structured hierarchy. And that begins to help us understand we still don't know how it worked particularly, but I think we do understand that it's a very socially stratified system. Right. Um, um, Mark, can I just add some like maybe contextual information for our audience, like the bronze ritual vessels? Uh, actually, the I mean, just to follow Mark's uh, social hierarchy, um, uh, uh, discussion actually i mean one thing is for for the type in chinese uh, bronze age or, or the the most important thing for chinese bronze age is the ritual bronze ritual vessels and if you go to museums you see them in green because they are covered by corrosion but when you freshly cast them i mean they are when they are freshly made they show different colors some of them are gold some of them are silverish some of them are kind of bit dumb um, gray uh, color and uh, and there's a um, and these colors are deeply linked to to the to the owners uh, show social status because this uh, for example I mean these ritual these ritual vessels are always used in set one type of vessel will go with another type of type of vessel for a certain kind of ceremony and only some people know this very well they know this extremely well like our afternoon tea we know what kind of tea set we use. But uh, for archaeologists, we can only see from the tomb uh, evidence that uh, which one is uh, paired which, uh, uh, with the others, but uh, not exactly how, uh, not the exact composition. But just think about uh, five or six bronze ritual vessels laying in front of your table. Some of the, you, you do expect them to be, at least the, the color should be consistent. You don't want them to be like uh, one gray, one silver, one Van Van Gogh Van Gogh ish, so that really I mean uh, that is that is really what we discovered for the top elite uh, top elite uh, metal assembly because because they are because of their un uh, consistent alloying composition and their their color are, are just uh, like I mean always consistent but if you just go slightly downwards the social social hierarchy to the slightly like not top elite but uh, still elite people, I mean, you can see that they can't control this uh, color issue very well. They have to use other um, um, type of color to sometimes to replace or uh, to fill the position on their table. So that is really a, a, a kind of a very strong um, connection between the, the material you can access and the, the social hierarchy, uh, the position of the social, uh, in the entire social hierarchy you are, you, you are located. So was it um, maybe even regulated? I know in Europe, n not that long ago, um, there were different colors, for example, that only royalty were allowed to use, uh, you know, garments, um, like a royal blue or some specific reds, depending on the country. So was it maybe even regulated that way? Is there some evidence for that? Oh, that's uh, that's a great question. I mean, for sh uh, Shang period, we don't know because we don't have this kind of text textual uh, information. But uh, but uh, 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 when we move to the Warring States period or later, we can say that the golden color, golden yellow or golden color, they call it golden yellow Huang Huang Jin. I mean, they this is the top color, and then the silver ish color is. Uh, is a kind of middle color and 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 the reddish color is kind of the third level color and when when you come to the later period like the different dynasties choose to dif choose different uh, different colors i mean yeah, to the medieval china like the tang dynasty they think the purple is very important but that is not uh, no longer related to the to the uh, uh, to, to to the metal so so it's i mean color is part of the the recognition of the social status, um, but for the Bronze Age, because because of the lack of evidence, lack of the textual evidence, it, we, we couldn't like uh, um, I mean, reach that level of uh, of uh, I mean, 
I mean, uh, level of uh, accuracy, I would say. It's so interesting. I wanted to check with Joyce, Kyle, and Ryan. Did you have questions? I've, I have been taking over a little bit, so please go ahead. Bless your microphone. Well, I'll ask a very general question. I'm wondering what, what do you think, if anything, you've learned from this work that might have implications for um, other regions of the world? That's a good question. Not, yes. um, in some senses, I think we might argue, Ray may disagree with me, but actually, um, I think what it teaches you is China is very different to the rest of the world. Um, I don't think um, until you may become to, you know, almost the, the early modern period in Europe, I don't think you get the same level of um, centralized control and the same the same sort of value system. So in a sense, what it teaches you is that China is so different from, from uh, you know, 2000 BC onwards. Um, there are similar issues in, in Western Europe, for example, um, but they're not, they're not, they're not the same. But for example, um, if you look at the early Bronze Age in Western Europe, you find that the metal composition of the daggers and the metal composition of the axes are different. And uh, it, it would, so it looks like there's a, there's a, a recipe for making axes and it's important that you use that recipe to make the axe because you never mix axes and daggers. We see recycling, but you don't recycle between axes and daggers because I think that's something symbolic about the power of axes and daggers. So in one sense, the work in China um, tells you that China is different to the rest of the world. Um, but on the other hand, it does suggest that we, we, we should never approach trying to understand these artifacts from a purely technological perspective, that they have symbolic value, they have ritual value, and that there are rules which apply um, that maybe we don't get very well at the moment. So I think it's, it's saying, look, you know, don't just bring a 21st century technological interpretation to these things. They have biographies and lives that we need to understand. Thank you. It's all very interesting. Yeah, I agree. Do you think it's because China developed like written language so early on that it kind of um, you know, made it even possible to have such a complex, um, centralized system um, that that you um, that you see. Um, I'll guess an answer, and then Ray can give the proper <laughs> answer. I'm not convinced that it's purely writing that's the um, that's the controlling factor. I think it's scale. If, for example, China is just so big that it, it, it's organized and it's centrally controlled. If you look on a smaller scale in Europe, for instance, you see something similar. For instance, um, in the texts that come from the Minoan palace, uh, palaces on, on Crete, it's quite clear that the palaces are controlling certain products. And one of the products that they're controlling is metal, copper. Mm -hmm. The other thing they're controlling are textiles, um, clothing, wool, um, that sort of thing. And the third thing they control are perfumes. 
And those are state monopolies um, during the palatial period in Crete. So in a sense, it's, it's the same story. It's just that, you know, Crete, the Minoans, is just such a small scale compared to the scale of central China during the Bronze Age that the patterns, it's a city-state model, whereas you actually have a real empire in China. And, and so I think the difference is scale. It's not so much writing. I mean, there's also writing in Mesopotamia and Egypt, and they too have some imperial controls, but it's just not on the scale that we see in China. Great, uh, Mark. And uh, uh, but just follow on Mark's uh, argument. I totally, I completely agree that writing is is. Uh, we need to think about writing in like more, uh, more from a wider perspective. Because actually, the earliest form of writing in China is oracle books, and it's it's about three three hundred three thousand two hundred years uh, two hundred years ago, and it is not the earliest writing at all. It's a, it's much later than um, what Mark just said um, in Mid East, and 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 still scholars debate about the origin of Chinese writing because I mean, uh, it uh, for the oracle bones it looks like the, it, it kind of like invented o overnight. It's suddenly you you got this kind of during the late Shang Dynasty thousands thousands of uh, I mean animal uh, the the turtle shells. Ox, ox uh, scapulars. I mean, writing uh, carved with very sophisticated uh, characters, with the very sophisticated uh, grammars, and and uh, they they show ritual function, and they really write down every detail, like the the queen gave the birth to the kid uh, to to a new son, and 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 whether they fighting, whether they should fight with uh, with their enemies, etc. etc. But that is not uh, not not the earliest. The, at all, um, but I do, uh, I do feel like uh, um, I want to borrow a uh, a, a sinologist, uh, um, uh, Lothar Lederos, Professor Lothar Lederos' argument. I mean, I heard from one of his uh, lectures and also his books, very, very interesting. It is kind of like uh, the writing is kind of amplifier for the Chinese uh, 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 centralization model, as Mark said. It's because I mean. I mean, after the Shang Dynasty, during the I mean Eastern Zhou Dynasty, now I mean, um, and and then Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, unified the whole China and standardized writing. And after that, the the characters can be always um uh, understood by the later 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 generations to some level. Not not every single character. Even now, I don't uh, I myself do not learn um uh, do not learn uh, Asian Chinese. I can still read. Uh, Chinese characters like two hundred two thousand years ago, um, that's that's quite something because I mean through this kind of continuous um, uh, writing uniform um, sort of uniform writing, I mean the the philosophy, the the thinking, the technology can be passed down generation by generation, and also the writing has this kind of special power in China, and that is the, what I heard from Professor Lederer's lecture, which is I feel very striking because in in Europe in Christian Entity. I mean, um, when we go to church, we 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 uh, we show respect to the to the patterns, to the images. Um, but uh, we do do not show. Uh, we, there's no church like showing three letters God, and 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 then we we just sing a song and doing service to under these three letters. But in China, yes, because men, if you go to villages, you go to you go to you go to um, mountains. I mean, a lot of mountains are covered by very big characters. And these characters shows power, and people often go to that mountains, go to go to the, these big characters, and show respect, worship their ancestors doing ceremonies. So, so yes, I mean, on one hand, China invented characters uh, writings quite late, or uh, um, somehow they. Sh uh, but on the other hand, I mean, the the writing really is a big amplifier for the for the entire social organization. I think there's a very interesting difference between early writing in China and early writing in Egypt and Mesopotamia. And that is that in the West, um, writing was essentially about accounting. It was mm -hmm. about recording crops and taxation, and it was sort of an administrative 
function. In China, it, it wasn't really that. It was it, it, because of its origin on the oracle bones. It's a means of communicating with the ancestors and the divine. And I think writing took a very different um, path in China because it has this ritual divine type function, um, which was, I mean, you could argue that in Egypt they used hieroglyphs to, you know, but, it, but it's different. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the core of, the, of writing in the West is an accounting function and the core of writing in China is a divine function. And that makes them very different, I think. Well, that is really interesting. I haven't thought about that before, that the religion itself to worship basically ancestors kept, so basically you mean that it kept the continuity of the culture and also the written language and the language. So that because you kind of, pray to the ancestors you keep it alive out of respect so in that way there's like a thousand of years of continuity of the same language and the same written language that's that's really interesting um to me did that scale up the education also um quite efficiently education you mean the ability to read yeah, exactly. That because it's also involved in religion, was there a um, higher motivation for everyone to be able to read and maybe even write um, earlier on? I would guess not. I mean, I, I, I don't know what levels of literacy would actually have been in, in Bronze Age China. I suspect, like in in Mesopotamia and Egypt, it was a it was a scholarly uh, priestly activity. I think because in China they're pictographs, that maybe um, maybe um, ordinary people would recognize pictographs as being well in later times symbol of the Buddha, for instance. Um, but without necessarily being, so it's a combination of a picture and, and a writing. And I think that again makes it slightly different. I mean, hieroglyphs uh, were that too, but they died out in Egypt essentially. Um, but I, the, the first point you made, I'd go even further. It's not the fact that um, ancestor worship meant uh, uh, a continuity of tradition and language. I think it's important to remember that certainly through the Shang and the Zhou, that the, the, the power of the emperor comes from his ability to communicate with the ancestors and that the, the emperor derives his power from um, the, li the lineages um, that went before him. So it's a, that, that ritual connection, which is where bronzes come aim in, because they were part of the ritual for communicating with the ancestors, that, that, that the very power of the emperor himself depended on his ability to communicate with the ancestors. So I think, you know, it's even stronger than just the continuity. It's, it's, it's fundamental. Mm. That's really interesting. And, and back to the scale, since it was such a big um, empire, it, do you think the stability also came from because they just didn't have to import and export, so they didn't have to rely on other influences like different religions, different languages, so much like in European countries where there was a big turnover of culture, religion, and so on, and different tribes uh, moving around. Do you think it's because they were kind of independent of other, um, they could basically self-sustain everything they needed? Uh. 
Um, I think geography plays a very important role in the development of China. It is essentially geographically isolated from the rest of Eurasia by uh, Tibet, the Himalaya, and the, um, the, the, the deserts. It's essentially, it, it is able to um, develop in isolation from anything um, outside that. That's not to say they didn't um, import, the, I mean, they imported bronze technology, I think. Uh, that came from the West. But I think geography played a very important part. And I'm reminded of the famous conversation between Lord McCartney in 1797 AD, who was sent to China uh, by the British um, king. Um, and uh, the Qianlong Emperor met McCartney and took one look at uh, the gifts that he'd brought and said, we have everything under the sun here. We have no need of your, <laughs> uh, of your gifts. And I think, you know, that, that there's a certain political posturing going on there. But I think essentially the message is, uh, you know, that the, the Chinese empire, um, which saw itself as the centre of the world, um, was incredibly independent of the rest of what was going on in the rest of the world, unless it chose not to be. And then you get issues of the Silk Road and the, the Han and the Tang communications along the Silk Road. But, but I do think geography played a very important part in, in the ability of the Chinese culture to develop essentially on its own for 5,000 years. Uh, I, I would just add uh, one point that because uh, because if we back to the Bronze Age, like the Shang Dynasty, actually, I mean Shang Dynasty is not is like only like maybe perhaps the half of Bronze mark. <laughs> if we do yes. that, yeah, it's uh, and uh, and actually the Shang Dynasty or the earlier or uh, um, the Shang Dynasty is very interesting because it is a low located in the poorest region in terms of metal resources. But uh, it turns out to be the biggest consumer of the, of the metal resources. It produces the largest number of, of bronze, finished bronze objects. And, uh, and, that, and also it continues like uh, into the Western Zhou and also Eastern Zhou, but, uh, but Eastern, in, during, the, uh, during Eastern Zhou, that is another issue because the southern, Southerners, like the true state, rise up. And the Southerners, I mean, like the uh, people, as we said, uh, sit, uh, located along the Yangtze River are important because they, they control the metal. They control metal very, and, uh, and people on, on the north of uh, of, uh, north to, to the central plains of China, uh, on the, like um, in the Mongolia steppe, northeast part of China, modern China nowadays, um, they are very important because they also they connect to the Eurasia steppe. Then they they can have a wider perspective, a uh, wider pers uh, 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 information supply of what happened outside the, uh, across the Eurasia uh, continent, um, and also they have uh, courses. And they have a, a gold and silver, this kind of technology. I mean, um, this. So, so basically, what really underpins this kind of, I mean, uh, regional interaction is a very, very sufficient, very powerful network. And uh, because of this network, that you can, I mean, people like the Shang people who do not have metal, I mean, in their backyard can can still produce a lot of metal. I mean, I mean thousands of tons of metal. I mean. Uh, over over ten over ten or twenty years. That's this uh, this kind of network is really important that supports the the scale of production or or or, or anything further like the the state building and uh, other things um in, in Chinese history. Um, Hansen and Peter, you joined the stage. Welcome. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, wonderful presentation. I have a couple of questions, um, uh, but first one uh, was partially answered by uh, uh, one of you. Um, yeah, I, my question was, uh, the first question was, uh, how did the uh, metallurgy, uh, the uh, bronze metallurgy emerge? Uh, I think you said the, uh, it's actually uh, the uh, imported from maybe the West, 
And uh, then uh, my follow-up question would be, how did the uh, uh, metallurgy, uh, the bronze metallurgy technology emerge in the West? And, uh, and second question would be the, uh, you mentioned the uh, the usage of bronze. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, yeah, the usage of bronze is um, mainly for um, the ceremonial uh, purposes. And does it have other uh, the utilization? Say, uh, I I think I read the there were uh, bronze weapons. So uh, it seems that you haven't mentioned that or. Uh, any other tools that um, uh, that is um, in the uh, in the uh, within the usage uh, main usage of bronze? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you. I'll I'll just I think I'll just repeat your question if I'm correct too, and then I can uh, we can answer right. And okay, is it is it okay, Mark? Yeah. Oh, I, think, I, I think I heard the question. It's about bronze weapons. Oh, uh, actually, there's another. Uh, the, the first question is about origination of Chinese metallurgy and uh, and also oh. the West uh, origination of metallurgy in the West. Am I right? Uh, yes, the origin of the uh, metallurgy technology. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um. Well. Uh, this is a long and complicated story, but um, what we think is the case is that bronze or copper metallurgy started in Western Eurasia, probably around modern day Turkey, Anatolia, the Near East, Mesopotamia, that part of the world. And that was probably 5000 years ago. Um, uh, but it, it traveled along what was to become the Silk Road through, uh, through nomads, essentially, and, and travelers, and entered China, let's say, about 2000 BC, two and a half thousand BC. Yeah. Um, so 2000 years after it was invented in Western Asia. Um, and it got into China, but what I would say is that the China, once it got into China, um, the Chinese did something very different with metal to what people were doing in Europe. Um, partly technologically about using um, molded castings, they, they never, up until quite recently, they never really used um, beaten metal, they always cast, all, all the objects were cast. They probably didn't have lost wax casting until uh, a later period, that's debatable. Um, so they did something very different with it. I think the question of weapons is an interesting one. Um, and I think it relates to the social stratification of the Chinese court. Um, unlike Western Europe and Eurasia, the leaders, the emperors, were not in general the people who led the army. There are some exceptions, but mostly the elite didn't fight. Um, mostly um, the army uh, would have fought, um, but that, that you don't have that tradition of single combat, which you have in Eurasia. You know, if you read Homer it's, uh, and, and the, the Iliad, it's all about, you know, the Achilles prince of here fights with somebody, uh, Agamemnon, you know, whoever. Um, and it's all about elite combat. And weapons are the key issue in elite combat. It's different in China. In general, the elites didn't fight. Um, and the army would have been a mass army of um, press recruits, probably. Um, and they would have fought with arrows and um, halberds, not swords particularly. So weapons um, do exist in, in China in large quantities, um, but they're not 
tools of the elite. So you don't get the same prestige attached to swords and, and armor as you get in the West. So I think it's, it's because of the social hierarchy that weapons are very low, low um, social status. Uh, I just want to add, add one quick example, like um, 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 or for, to follow up Mark said, for, for example, for some late Shang top elite or, or a generous uh, military generous tomb, we know he, he is a military general because we can read his name and his and those military families have a special name. And, uh, and in somebody's tomb, we can find like 200 weapons and they are, are, are 20, uh, 20 20 or 50 good blades or five, uh, another uh, 50 spearheads. They, they all show identical uh, similar uh, shapes. Actu actually, for the, this is quite different from like the what, what archaeologists discovered on the Eurasia step that, that as, as Mark said, again, um, the, the personal weapons show the, show the per personal um, identity. So basically for the, sh uh, for, the top, um, for the elite in China, I mean, um, one person do not need uh, 50 daggers, which is obviously, and actually this is, this is, this is just for the uh, soldiers who defend his uh, afterlife. So the, the, probably the concept of battle, doing a battle uh, is different as well. And the best example of that is, of course, the first emperor, Qin oh, Shuang, yes, yes. Um, who's buried with a terracotta army of 8,000 soldiers, and they all have arrows and gerb blades. And so they do have them, but it's not the, the top elite that have them. They have no social status, really. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter. Oh, go ahead, Tennyson. Oh, no, uh, just uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe that's a little bit the field, the uh, question of field. How, how did then um, the, uh, uh, the Western Eurasian people discover bronze or the metallurgy? Uh, but maybe that's a far, far field, uh, whatever you, if you don't have time, just uh, ignore it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm interested in that. You could answer that question for sure. I didn't hear a question. Sorry, I uh, I couldn't I I can't hear a question just now. Uh, can could somebody repeat? Hanson, do you want? Oh yes, yeah. I uh, I'm just saying that. I just asking if um uh, what the uh, how did the uh, Eastern, I mean, not Eastern, uh, Eurasian people discovered uh, bronze metallurgy. Uh, oh, how Eurasia people discovered bronze metallurgy? That's a, oh, that's a question, right? Ow. I think, I think that's a, yeah, how Eurasia people discovered the question. Um, I can't, I can start. Uh -huh. I can, I can answer that, yeah. I think. Um, I think in, in Eurasia, in Western Eurasia, there's a long tradition of using malachite, copper carbonate, for jewellery, for decoration. Um, so going back 10,000 years, we have examples of malachite jewellery. And malachite is a very rich ore of copper. So the speculation is that humans had been using malachite jewellery for 5,000 years and somebody somewhere discovered that if you throw it on the fire, you get molten copper out. And the suspicion is that the use of metal um, arises from the fact that malachite jewellery was common in Europe. But of course, there is no malachite jewellery in China. The, um, the, 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 the most important material in China is jade, and that's not an ore of metal. So you can heat it as much as you like, and you won't get any metal out of it. So again, the difference between China and Europe is that in China, they never used malachite jewelry. So they never discovered 
for themselves how to make how to smelt copper. Now there is an argument that actually they did, but that's a, a different argument. Ray, I'm going to have to go. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. Can I uh, yeah. check out and just leave you to one? Well, thank you, Mark, so much for your time. This was so interesting. So we really appreciate um, your talk and the time you put in here. And and uh, hopefully one day we'll talk again. Um, yeah, Mark, if, um, well, if I ask Katerina for your email address, would you mind if I sent you an email sometime in the near future? I just, um, I didn't have a, a good proper question formulated, but there have been a few that have come to mind that I would like to ask at a later time, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank All you. right, I'm going. I'm going to have some new. Yeah, so, thank you for, <laughs> yeah. for your answers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Happy weekend. Thanks, Bye. Ray. See you. See you. Ray, if you need to go, let us know. If not, we have... Yeah, I probably need, need to take off now as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's Friday night. Ray yeah. understand. It's really late for you by now. So, thank you so much for coming here and taking the time Great. and sharing your work. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting us. That's, that's a really jo jolly experience. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And please come back one day, um, maybe update us on your research. And um, yeah, I hope um, you get to do Great. this in many more years and, and share with us one day. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, I will. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for, 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 for your time and the questions. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I have enjoy your weekend. You too. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Peter, um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, this was such a pleasure, such a great discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it. We have actually a room tomorrow um, with two guest speakers. Um, Dr. Wu, she is, um, she was earlier here in, in, in the room. Um, she is um, an engineer working in neuroscience technology development, and she's right now she did her PhD at the Northwestern, and now she's at Neuralink, and she is sharing her latest publication with her colleague. Um, it will be really interesting new developments in, in neuroscience research technologies. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you.